All right, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. I know we've got a lot of familiar faces today, but if you are joining us for the very first time as we come close to the end of the school year, then we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world through free live digital broadcasts. Now, this is the conclusion of our Epic Oceans Week, which is kind of sad. It's always sad when we end big program series. It's been a ton of fun. And for those classes that might have tuned in, you guys should check out our Ocean Week Canada website, which I'm going to pull up right here on the side of the screen. Uh, Ocean Week Canada is an amazing initiative by Oceans Group Coast to Coast to Coast to Coast. We're including the Great Lakes in that. And so if you want to check out their events, amazing resources, and more, these groups are coming together to make a healthier ocean future for Canada and for the world. And it's been such a pleasure and privilege to run this amazing program series in support of that. All our YouTube sessions are, of course, on our YouTube channel. We have a playlist with all the Ocean Week Canada programs if you want to check out more on sharks or indigenous fisheries or all sorts of cool stuff that we've done all week long. So thank you for joining us again, and I'm excited to dive in. Now, as I said, it's a little sad we're wrapping up the week, but on a plus note, we are ending on a huge high note with one of my favorite speakers we ever bring on the broadcast, and that is Dr. Bill Halliday. He's joining us in Victoria, BC, and his work has him with the Wildlife Conservation Society of Canada, where he gets to go up to the high Arctic, some of the most remote and amazing places on this planet, to work with communities in getting marine soundscapes, listening in on that deep underwater world of all the amazing creatures that we share the North with. So, if you guys are as excited as I am to dive in on a big adventure, let's get started. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Halliday, and we can take it away. Dr. Halliday, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Jesse. It's great to be here. Awesome. Nice to have you here. And uh, so excited. We've got already like at least 15 classes from across Canada, the US, India, and more. Uh, welcome into all of them. And if you want to bring up your presentation and kick us off, I'm excited to get ready. Perfect. Nice shirt, by the way. I think it's very suitable. Thank you. I was going to talk about it in a minute. Okay. <laughs> I won't steal your thunder then. Uh... All right. So thank you for joining everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Bill Halliday. I work for Wildlife Conservation Society Canada, and today I'm going to talk to you about my work with Arctic marine mammals and climate change. So, a bit about me. Well, a long time ago, it feels like a really long time ago, I started my work in biology in the field. Um, I was a, an undergraduate student at Lakehead University in Thunder Bay, Ontario, and my first field season, my first summer doing any field work was actually in the Arctic. I went to Herschel Island, which I'll show you all on a map later on. Um, and I spent the entire summer trapping lemmings. Lemmings are small little rodents who you might have heard about through a video game or through the um, misinformation that they commit mass suicide, which they do not, by the way. Um, so that was me a long time ago. And then in my um, for my PhD research, my doctoral research, I switched gears again. I started working on snakes and beetles and, and how they select habitat, this photo of me in the middle. And now here I am, many years later, um, up on the sea ice in the Arctic, um, where I was that year putting out a, an acoustic recorder into the water to listen to marine mammals in the Arctic. Um, so I've, I've been all over the place. You can see that I'm wearing a shark shirt today. That's for two reasons. One, uh, sharks are really cool. Um, and the organization that I work for is Global Wildlife Conservation Society. And this is a shirt that I got from them from the New York Aquarium, where they have some sharks. And we also have a shark program um, elsewhere in the world. Uh, number two, I, all my whale shirts were in the wash, which is why you didn't get a whale shirt today. So where have I been? Here's a, um, a map of North America. The um, yellow stars are places that I've lived. So I've always lived in Canada. I grew up in Northern Ontario, just um, north of Lake Huron. And then I moved up to Thunder Bay um, in, um, in Northwestern Ontario, north of Lake Superior. And then I moved to Ottawa to do my PhD. And now I'm way across the country in Victoria. The red stars are all the places that I've been lucky enough to do research. Up in the Arctic, you can see two stars way up there in the central and western Canadian Arctic. Herschel Island is just a little bit further to the west, right by the Alaska border. But I've also done research all in southern Canada as well, around uh, where I live now, Vancouver Island, uh, in northwestern Ontario, and also near Ottawa and Quebec. And then I had the lucky chance to go down to Arizona to do one bit of field work as well. So I've been all over the place, but um, right now I'm almost exclusively focused on the Arctic. 
So the Arctic is home to some very spectacular mammals, and I'm just going to, marine mammals, and I'm just going to introduce you to them now. We've got bowhead whales. Bowhead whales are the longest living mammal in the world, known to live at least 200 years old. They also have the biggest head of any um, marine mammal, of any animal, really. Uh, their head makes up a third of their body, and it's just this huge, ginormous skull that they can actually use to ram into the ice and break through the ice so that they can come up to breathe. We also have narwhal, the unicorn of the sea. Narwhal live exclusively in the Arctic, um, in the Eastern Canadian Arctic, in Baffin Bay region, as well as around Greenland. Unfortunately, they don't live in the areas where I study, so I don't get to study them, and I wish I did because they're super cool. Next, we have beluga whales, known as the canaries of the sea because they sing so much. They have such unique vocalizations, and they're so varied. They're constantly changing. Um, they're very cool. Also called white whales because they're white. They live almost exclusively in the Arctic, except for the Canadian population that's down in the St. Lawrence River. Um, and some of the classes might actually be close to that, or maybe have even seen belugas in the St. Lawrence River before. But most of the world's belugas live in the Arctic. We have two known seal species, two seal species that live exclusively in the Arctic, bearded seals, named after their beard. <laughs> they have big whiskers that look like a beard. Um, and they have one of the coolest songs I've ever heard, and I'll play for you later on. And then we have ring seals, the smallest seal in the world, cute little guys named after the rings on their fur. Uh, and they also make cool vocalizations, but I'm biased. I think all of these animals make really cool sounds, which we'll talk about later. So what makes these animals special? What lets them live in the Arctic? Well, for one, they all have thick blubber. Blubber is the fat underneath their skin. It serves as insulation. It keeps the cold water outside and it lets them keep their heat on the inside. So they have thicker blubber than any other related marine mammals. Uh, oh, skipping too fast. Um, they also have a lot of adaptations for dealing with sea ice, for living in an ice covered ocean. All three of the whale species have a reduced dorsal fin. Their dorsal fin is the little fin on their back. If you think about something like a killer whale that has this giant fin on their back, killer whales can't go through sea ice the same way other, um, these Arctic whales can. And the, it means that their back fins, their dorsal fins, don't get stuck on the ice as they're, as they're swimming through water that's covered in ice. They have thick skulls, like I mentioned. The belugas and the narwhal also have thick skulls, not as thick as the bowhead, but that's used for ramming through ice. And then they, um, the seals, they have particularly long claws that they use for digging into the ice. Ring seals are actually able to dig through the ice and maintain breathing holes as well as uh, dens for their young, um, when, which they actually give birth to on the ice. So all Arctic marine mammals rely on ice and that's what makes them very special. Seals use ice for hauling out, so when they need to take a break from swimming, they climb out onto the ice and they take a break there. They use it for mating and giving birth and raising their young. Whales use ice for predator defense. If a bunch of killer whales are around trying to eat beluga, bowhead, or narwhal, one of their biggest strategies is to find the nearest patch of ice and hang out there. Because, like I said, the killer whales with their big dorsal fins can't get into that thick ice the same way that these other arctic whales can. Uh, and finally, beluga, narwhal, and ring seal all eat fish that only live near sea ice. These fish are ice dependent. They eat sea ice algae. And so belugas, narwhal, and ring seal are very linked to this ice because that's where their food is. So all this to say sea ice is important to Arctic marine mammals. What's going on with sea ice right now? Um, I have a video loaded up here that was produced by NASA. Um, so this is all based on... Um, ice data collected from satellites. Uh, and once it finally loads here, and if it doesn't load, I'll get Jesse to go, but it looks like it's thinking about it. Here we go. All right, I'm gonna hit play. And so I'm gonna describe this video as it's loading. So we've got really thick old ice as the really, really white colors in the middle. And that, those white colors are always there in the middle because even right now in the midst of climate change, there's still sea ice all year round in the Arctic. It hasn't completely disappeared yet. So every summer, the ice shrinks just down to that very white, white level. And every winter, it spreads out. You can see that kind of light blue color, which is new ice that's frozen and formed in the wintertime. And so we get this cycle of sea ice. It freezes in the winter and expands out of covering the Arctic. And then it melts in the summer and contracts. 
But what we've been seeing with climate change is that every year ice is decreasing in all sorts of ways. There's less and less of that thick white ice in the in the middle every year and um, ice is freezing later and it's melting earlier in the year and it's not freezing as far um, this year for example the uh, the Bering Sea which is over in Alaska and Russia um, it was ice free up until after New Year's uh, this year, which is very late. Usually it's freezing back in late October and early November. So we're seeing these just drastic changes in sea ice, less and less sea ice, which means less habitat for these animals. And I'm going to stop that video there and move on because it could go for forever. So what does sea ice loss mean for Arctic marine mammals? Well, for one, there could be a shifting timing of their migration because many of these animals migrate great distances. For example, the belugas and bowheads that I study, they migrate 3,000 kilometers one way every year. So 6,000 kilometers in total every year as they migrate to the Canadian Arctic in the summertime and then they migrate over to the Bering Sea in Alaska in the wintertime. So if ice is melting earlier, it means that they can migrate to their summer area earlier and if it's freezing later, it means that they don't have to migrate back there later. Um, they, can, they can stick around in their summer area for longer. Shifting habitat use, because if there's less and less ice and it's kind of changing where it is, it's maybe getting further and further offshore. Maybe these animals are tracking that ice and they're, they're kind of following the ice, especially for the animals that rely on ice for food. The loss of sea ice is also lift, uh, leading to a changing food web. So maybe you've learned about a food web or, or the food chain um, in your class, in your science classes so far. So the food web is all the way from the tiny, especially in the in the marine environment, all the way from tiny little phytoplankton that get energy from the sun and create their own food to the zooplankton that eat the phytoplankton to then all the animals that eat the zooplankton, which include fish, bowhead whales, um, uh, other invertebrate animals, and then of course the top predators that are eating the other that are eating the other vertebrate animals, the fish. So the belugas, narwhal, and seals that are eating fish, or even the killer whales who are eating the whales and the seals. So that's our food web. We've got all the way from the very simple organisms that make their own food, all the way up to the complicated animals that rely on other animals for food. And this food web is shifting. Um, species that didn't used to be in the Arctic are coming up, such as uh, in my region, uh, we've got some new fish species that are showing up. We've got capelin and sand lance and salmon species that never used to be in some of these remote areas. And they're now becoming more and more common. And they're even showing up in the diet of these fish eating marine mammal species. There could be more competition with southern species. So if we've got other whales coming up, so for example, the over in the Chukchi Sea, north of the Bering Sea, so this is over in Alaska and Russia, we're seeing more and more humpback whales and minke whales coming up that never used to be there, and they're coming for longer periods of time. So new species shifting in the Arctic, they are competing with um, the native species, the like bowhead whales, for example, uh, for food and maybe even for space. So there's a, a big implication there for the animals. And finally, less sea ice means more access for humans. Humans are using the Arctic more and more for shipping and for resource extraction. So you might have heard of the fabled Arctic shipping routes, the Northwest Passage. Maybe you even heard about it in your history class where sailors um, a couple hundred years ago effectively were trying to find a way across North America by ship. So they were going to the Arctic and they were trying to make their way through the ice to get from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. Well, now that ice, that that shipping route is ice free all summer long. So people trying to do that route um, don't run into the same issues that they did 200 years ago because of sea ice loss. And as there's less and less sea ice in the Arctic, these routes are becoming more and more popular. And these ships are causing a lot of disturbance to marine mammals. So those are the issues that marine mammals are facing. What do I do? Well, for one, I work for a conservation organization. So we are very interested in conserving these species. That means that we're interested in making sure that they still have habitat to live in, that they're not, get, that they're not getting too disturbed by humans, that they're protected. And so to do that, I use a bunch of different approaches, but the main one that I'm gonna to talk to you about today is underwater listening. So that's where we take a microphone and put it underwater. This is, um, the microphone is called a hydrophone. And we listen to the sounds that the marine animals are, are making, specifically the marine mammals, but also fish. Fish also make sounds and we can monitor them with underwater listening. We also listen to noise from ships. 
And so I'm going to play a bunch of examples from all of these images shown up here. So we're going to start with bearded seals because I mentioned them already and they're super cool. All the sounds are cool, but bearded seals are really neat. And I bet you've never heard anything like them. So here we go. Here's a bearded seal. Kind of sounds like a sci-fi movie. They hold these long calls called trills. They go from high frequency down to low frequency. They go up and down and down and up. And they can hold these calls for well over a minute at a time. Um, and you try to whistle for a minute and see if you can do it. Because I bet you can't. Because I certainly can't. Very cool sounds that they make. And when it's during their mating season, you can hear these sounds 24 hours a day for a couple of months at a time. Um, and they just dominate the sounds underwater. They're very cool. Next up, we have ring seals. Ring seals are a bit different. They're quieter. They don't hold these long calls, but they make calls that are called barks and yelps, kind of like a dog. And you can listen in and figure out why that is. So they kind of chatter. They go... The bark is the that low sound. The, and the is the yelp. Next up, we have our bowhead whales. They are incredible. Um, they can be heard, possibly, from 100 kilometers away underwater, which is just ridiculous. Think about any sound that you've ever heard that was 100 kilometers away. You probably haven't heard one. That's, for one, because of how loud bowheads are, but also for how well sound travels underwater. Here's a bowhead call. And they make a bunch of different calls. One of the most common ones during the summertime is just a low moan. They go, mm. it's not that interesting, but you can hear it from very far away. But during the winter time and during their fall and spring migrations, they sing. And singing is somewhat like those calls that you just heard there, but they'll repeat them. They'll sing these repeated notes over and over again, which are very cool. And finally, we've got belugas, our canaries of the sea. And you could just listen to them and figure out why I call them that. <laughs> so belugas make a ton of different sounds. They use sound to communicate with one another, which is the sounds that we were just hearing there. Those were their whistles mixed in with some pulsed um, calls. They also use... Um, sound for echolocation. So if you think about a bat and how it makes these high pitch calls to learn about its environment, well, so do beluga whales and other toothed whales. They emit these high frequency sounds that then bounce back to them and they listen for them and it lets them know what's around them, including what food is around them. And finally, I had to put in a ship here so you know what they're listening to because underwater noise is a huge issue for these animals and for all marine mammals, really. <laughs> This is a ship going by our recorder. It's very raspy, it's very loud. The closer the ship is, the louder it gets. And it effectively blocks all of the communication signals that these animals are making. So the area where I work is the Western Canadian Arctic, shown up here with the, the red box. So that's the Eastern Beaufort Sea and the Amundsen Gulf. And that's in our territories of Northwest Territories and Yukon. Um, within Canada, although I am starting to do more work in Nunavut as well, which is further to the east here. I'm just showing some of the things that these animals are doing here up on the screen. So our seals, they're not very migratory. They do make some big movements, but for the most part, it's not it's not very predictable, and they're moving around the area like this. Um, and it's not necessarily in a circle like that. They're just, they're living within this area, so we can't really predict that they're going to move to one area or another in spring versus summer. The whales, on the other hand, I'm going to show you what they're, do. they're doing. Let's pretend it's wintertime right now. The whales are all down, down in the Bering Sea. And then they migrate. They migrate up over to the Canadian Arctic, and they spend the summertime feeding and getting lots of energy reserves. And then they migrate back to the Bering Sea. So the listening that we're doing with our underwater microphones, our hydrophones, is throughout this area of the Western Canadian Arctic. And all these points up here on the map, I'm not going to spend much time talking about them, but all these points are different areas where we've been listening, where we have data. And so we're trying to figure out when they arrive in the region. That's what we do with this, this point here in the, 
this is actually right at Herschel Island, which I mentioned earlier, which is in the western portion. So we can figure out when they arrive into the region for when they go past that hydrophone. And then we can find out how much time they're spending in this region eating, foraging in the summertime. And then we can also look at some of their northward movements when they go past these recorders over here, because they actually spend a lot of time up in the sea ice north of these two islands, Banks Island and Victoria Island. So the gear that we use, um, these are called acoustic recorders. They have a microphone or a hydrophone on the end, which is this black, um, this black um, uh, piece here. So that's a, a pressure sensor. It, it records all the sounds. We take that and we, we put the whole instrument down at the bottom of the ocean for a year at a time. Uh, this is on the bottom right. This is one that's been down at the bottom of the ocean for a year and it got just got covered in kelp and all sorts of algae. Comes back with lots of stuff on it, but it also comes back with lots of data. We get the, we go out and we drop off the gear in small boats like this, and we go back out and we pick them up in small boats like this. Um, sometimes we have to go to very remote locations and we have to take a, a plane and land on a remote beach, and then we get out our Zodiac and we have to inflate it with air and then put a motor on it and go out in the ocean and then come back and load everything back in the plane. Um, so these are quite the adventures sometimes. Um, more recently, we've been working off of some big ships. So this is um, just looking over the side of an icebreaker ship that was up in the Arctic. And this is our, our whole setup. It's got a big heavy anchor chain at the bottom. This is the, the acoustic release in yellow that lets us get it back a year later. This is our acoustic recorder with the hydrophone on top. And this is another uh, piece of uh, instrument um, instrumentation that measures how salty and how warm the ocean is. And then these these big balls up at the top, those are floats that let the thing come to the surface uh, a year later. And lucky for you, I am currently right now working with these because this year, because of the pandemic, I can't go to the field, unfortunately, but I can get all the gear ready, which is what I'm doing right now with this hydrophone. And um, I'm shipping it up to people who live up in the communities where we work and they're going out and putting things in the water for me. So I'm getting all the gear ready here, getting everything ready, shipping it up to them in a box. And all they have to do is tie a couple of knots, go out on their boat and drop it in the water for me effectively. And that's what we're, uh, we're doing again this year. So what have we found so far? Well, I'm just going to show you some, some figures, some graphs. Um, they might be kind of boring, so I'm going to skim through them pretty quickly. But what we found typically is we listen and we find that these bars over here on this graph, they show that we're hearing lots of whales in the summertime in July and August and, and a little bit in September. So beluga and bowhead whales, we hear when the ice is low and the ice is shown by this gray line. But then the ice starts to form and the whales go away. They do their migration. But then we start to hear the seals, which are shown here by these different gray bars. We hear the seals a lot when the ice is around. If we zoomed in on this portion here, July, August, and September, we'd also start hearing ships and small boats, which is what we see over here. We don't really hear those ships when there's lots of ice around, but we hear them a lot, especially in the end of August and early September, which is what this figure is showing. But we've been recording for long enough, and because we've been recording for year-round recordings, we're looking for differences in patterns. What's, what's happening with these animals? And just recently, the winter of 2018, 2019, we recorded bowhead whales in the Western Canadian Arctic all winter long. They didn't migrate. They stayed, or at least some of them didn't migrate. They stayed in their summer foraging area in the winter. That could be related to ice. They're, the ice was thin enough that they could survive in this environment, even when the ice was, even in the peak of winter when ice was at its highest. So those are the sort of things that we're trying to measure. We're trying to measure if their migration timing has shifted, but maybe they even skip their migration entirely and stay in their summer area all year long. We're also trying to look at how whales are responding to ships. What happens when a ship comes by? Do they change what they're doing? And so with these um, recordings, what we found was before a ship was nearby, there were lots of beluga whale vocalizations. And then after the ship came by, we stopped hearing beluga vocalizations. Then they then after a while, we started hearing them again. And what we think happened, especially based on what some of the, the local Inuvialuit people have told us is that the whales are leaving the area when a ship comes by. They hear a ship, they leave. And once the ship is gone, they come back. This map on the left is just showing all of the ship tracks in red and the acoustic recorder with this star here. So that's kind of what we were doing. We were listening, listening from this area and all the ships were coming by here. And maybe the whales were around our recorder and then the ship came by and they left the area. Maybe they went up here to the north and then they came back again once the ship, um, once the ship was gone. 
We're also doing some mapping exercises where we, we are able to map out where the whales are um, based on some data collected from um, some of our colleagues. They put these trackers on the whales so we can see where they are every day. And so we're able to map out the different areas that they use. And then we're able to look at where the ships are in, in relation to whale the, where the whales are. And that's what these maps are showing. The whales are, are shown here by these big blobs on the map, the green and, and pink blobs. So in the summertime in July and August, they're spending time in the Western Canadian Arctic where I work. And then as September starts, the blob expands and moves further to the west and that's where the whales are moving they're moving further to the west and eventually in october here you can see that they've they're completely out of the canadian arctic and they're they're over in alaska and all these ship tracks are shown in black these are the ship tracks that are happening at the same time and you can look at the number of ship tracks that are overlapping with all the whale areas to try and figure out when they're getting exposed to the most ships so what does all of this mean well Arctic marine mammals live in a place that's changing quickly. There is a loss of habitat. There's more disturbance from ships. So how will Arctic marine mammals respond? How will they survive going into the future as um, there are more ships and there's less ice? Well, I think they're going to adapt a bit. They're going to learn to live with these ships, but it, it's going to come at a cost. It might mean that they're less healthy in the future. It might mean that they're no longer living in the areas that they're living right now. So those are the sort of things that we're trying to track. Um, and that's effectively it. So thank you so much for listening to me. This is the ship actually that goes out and deploys some of our gear, the icebreaker that I was talking about. And I actually took this photo the first year I was in the Arctic when I was on Herschel Island. I wasn't even doing marine mammal research, but I took a, ship, a picture of this ship from the island. It's called the Sir Wilfrid Laurier. And then 10 years later, I started actually working with that ship, working with the people on that ship to deploy and recover our gear. So that's kind of fun that I went full circle 10 years later. And thank you so much for listening to me, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Holiday. That was so, so cool. And I, I, again, every time I get a chance to hear those animals, I mean, I've heard it many times. We've done many broadcasts here. It's just yes. captivating every single time. I mean, this is the coolest job in the world to get to listen into these uh, creatures. It's just so fantastic. I, I love uh, any time we can approach the natural world in a different way and appreciate it in a different way. I mean, most people get all these images. They get to see programs with us. But to hear in is a really special opportunity. So thank you so, so much. So many kids joining us live. I think we've got over 450 kids from across the continent and beyond. So welcome into all you guys. Um, for our live classes, I'll come to you in just a minute. If you're on YouTube and you want to share questions, please do share in the chat bar. And I'm going to begin with one from the SDG Warriors group joining us in Bangalore in India. They want to know, can we not use these sounds to guide aquatic organisms away from danger? Like, is there a way to use acoustic blasts to our advantage with this sort of conservation work? Funny enough, there is one example of that. And there were some, I believe they were beluga whales. And this was a while, this was a long time ago. This was like 30 or more years ago. There were beluga whales and they got stuck in the ice. It's something called ice entrapment. And that's where the beluga whales go in, they're doing something, but then the, it's, it's during the time of year when the ice is freezing and the ice froze in around them. So they were just stuck in this one area surrounded by ice. The ice was too thick and the ice was, the, the distance between where they were and the next bit of open water was just too far. And this icebreaker was out and they found out that that happened. And so they came in and they cleared a path, but the whales were, they were scared. They, they were hearing this loud icebreaker. They didn't know what to do, even though the icebreaker was actually there to help them. So what did they do? They played classical music through an underwater, um, sorry, just really loudly in their ship. And it transmitted through the hull into the water and the belugas got interested and they followed the ship out. That was a super, I don't, I don't know the exact details. I wasn't there, but that's one time that I know that they've used, that people have used sound to help animals. Other, otherwise, broadly speaking, the ocean is huge and being able to use speakers to kind of help animals get away from certain areas just isn't that realistic just because, especially in the Arctic, there's hundreds of kilometers between every single community. There's only a handful of ships going up every year. Speakers require power. There's lots of, there's lots of reasons why, why that just um, maybe isn't the most realistic, but in some times it is a useful thing and, and has been shown to be a useful thing. That is the greatest anecdote in any of our programs this week. I really want to know what song they played or what composer they played. It'd be like a great thing for any concerts in the future. Like, you know, this this saves whales. This music is amazing. Um, you know, one of the things, too, that I think uh, you highlighted a little bit and what we featured in a lot of broadcasts on this is increasingly around the world. And Canada is doing a lot of this 
field right now is to make sure that when ships do come into places, if there are a lot of ships, to make sure that they're as quiet as possible so they don't impact these marine mammals because it's really important to you know, prevent that from being a, a threat to them. We're seeing this with birds too around the world as where there's so much cacophony from city life that they've changed their calls to modulate to better attract mates because they can't compete with the sounds of cars and other things. So really a uh, cool active area of research, which is awesome. Um, let's head to Lethbridge, our Fleetwood family. We've got two uh, classes there jointly. So if we want to turn on our mic in Alberta, you guys can come up with two questions. I know we've got two classes today. So share it with us and we'll keep it going from there. Hi guys. Okay, Maddie is going to ask a bunch. Hi. Okay. So, Maddie, right here, honey. Um, what is the oldest whale that's ever lived? The oldest whale that ever lived was that 200-year-old bowhead whale that I was telling you about. And the reason we know that it's 200 years old is because a long time ago, and this is very sad, a long time ago, bowhead whales and other whales were hunted by humans. And um, and uh, people used their blubber for lots of things, and they, and they sold the meat. Um, and they did it at this big commercial scale, so it was happening lots, and it really had a bad impact on the whales. But one whale got a harpoon stuck in it, and it survived. And people found that harpoon in the whale much more recently. I think it was only about, it must have been about 10 years ago or so. And they found that harpoon stuck in the whale, and they analyzed it. And they found out that it was a 200-year-old harpoon. And that's how we know that that whale was at least 200 years old. Fantastic. You know, we hardly ever ask that question. We've been talking about a lot of old animals over the course of this series. In, in Boris Werner's presentation, we talked about 400-year-old Greenland sharks. And that's always a great question that we get from kids is, how do you know that sort of thing? So thank you for that uh, context. Let's go back to Alberta. If you guys have one more, come on up. There you go, man. What is a whale's most fragile bone? Oh, <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> well, I imagine it's their smallest bone. Um, and I don't really know the answer to that question. <laughs> I'm going to guess it's something in one of their flippers um, in one of their in one of their pectoral fins, because those are smaller bones. But they're really thick, so I don't think they're very fragile. Yeah. Um, Great question, and unfortunately, I don't really know the answer to it, though. Hey, I love when we can play Stump the Scientist in these programs. I mean, these sort of things are pretty tough. So there you go. Good job for that question, guys. Um, let's head to Alameen Elementary, if you guys want to unmute your mic, and then we'll head to California in a minute for the last of our live group. So come on in, Alameen, grade twos. Uh, if you can hear me, you're good to go. Where's the camera? We, we can't. It's it's okay. it's we, can hear you, we can hear you just fine. Your camera's moving down, but that's okay. Mm, yeah. Yes, uh, my name is Yvonne. What's your question? Um, what made you start learning about this? Yeah. Great question. So, from a very, I grew up in the country, I grew up on a farm, and I was very interested in wildlife from a very young age. So I decided that I wanted to be a biologist. And so I went to, I went to school, I went to university to be a biologist. And eventually, things just happen, you know, different opportunities come up, and I got a job opportunity to come work with Arctic whales, and I took it. Um, I'd spent a lot of time in the Arctic, and I'm very, I was very interested in doing a science that could be used for conservation. Um, and that's one of the main reasons that I did it. It wasn't necessarily that I that whales are are my favorite animals or anything like that. It was that um, I really love. I have a love for the Arctic, and I and I have a passion for conservation. And there was a good opportunity to do good conservation work on Arctic whales and seals. I love how many of our speakers come in, and it's this early interaction with wildlife that tends to lead to so many amazing careers. And I think that's such an important message for kids that if you get somewhere epic, great, but just take that time to go to local parks, streams, forests. It makes a world of difference. And you know, whether you end up an amazing scientist like Dr. Halliday or not, if you have that backdrop of being inspired by nature, it can go a long way to, to really doing some great things in your life. So great answer. Uh, let's head to Ms. Camarena's class. Joining us in Los Angeles, just unmute your mic, and you are good to go. Hi, thank you again for having us here on our last day of school. I have a fifth grade student named Bevins that has a question for you. Go ahead, Bevins. Uh, I would just like to know, um, in the ocean, what are bow, um, bowhead whales' greatest enemy or rival in the ocean? Oh, their greatest enemy, the killer whale. 
And the killer whale is probably the greatest enemy of every single whale species because despite killer whales only being, I don't know, a third of the length of a bowhead whale, they hunt as a pack, if you think about a pack of wolves. And some killer whales, not all killer whales, but some killer whales are whale eaters and seal eaters. And so they specialize on hunting whales. So a group of killer whales or orcas will surround a bowhead and will hunt it and will continue harassing it until they they get their food at the end. So that would definitely be the greatest rival of bowhead whales. We've uh, had orcas brought up in every single program this week. They're one of the coolest animals in the ocean. We've had so many questions on YouTube that I've sort of just avoided going into the deep orca thing. But for every class, when you're done this, look up an orca skull. It is like the most metal, amazing skull in the entire animal kingdom. They're the only animal that we know of that hunts blue whales, the biggest animal ever to exist. Killer whales have been observed hunting them and great white sharks. So very, very cool creatures. Uh, fantastic uh, wildlife, guys. Uh, let's head to YouTube for a minute and we'll come back to our live classes. Mr. Hill's class wants to know, uh, sort of a fitting end to that question, are there other types of whales and seals and how do they get along with one another? <laughs> Um, there, there are many, many types of whales and seals. Um, so I, I listed off three different species, belugas, bowheads, and narwhal. But there, there are so many species of whale around the world, and I don't have an exact number on that. But for example, other whales that kind of come into the Arctic during the summertime, we've got big, big baleen whales um, that are gray whales, minke whales, humpback whales, and fin whales all come up into the Arctic in the summertime. Um, there are also other toothed whales like killer whales and harbor porpoise um, and sperm whales that all also come up into the Arctic uh, in different areas of the Arctic in the summertime. Um, seals, there are plenty of seals that also come up into the Arctic. Um, harbor seals and um, spotted seals and hooded seals. And There, there are many seals. Uh, walrus are, are technically also a seal species, an Arctic seal species that I didn't mention. Um, in terms of whether or not they get along, you don't often see mixed groups of marine mammals because they're very social um, with each other. They, they tend to live in family groups uh, often, especially our, um, our toothed whales like killer whales, killer whales and dolphins, for example. They, um, they live in their family groups, so they don't really want to, to get along with other species or even other groups of whales. They just tend to avoid each other. Um, there have been um, very interesting cases, though, of some whales from different species getting along with one another. For example, there was a narwhal, I believe, that came down and um, and it was in the Gulf of St. Lawrence in Canada. And it got picked up by a pot of belugas and it hung out with belugas for a summer. Um, and it seemed, we think it probably made its way back to the Arctic after that. But it was just seen swimming along with belugas, which is not necessarily something that we see up in the Arctic. But in this area where there were no other narwhals around, it found a group of similar species and it hung out with them. How about that? The only example I've ever seen, which our students can readily see, uh, Blue Planet 2, which is the best natural history documentary ever, has an episode off New Zealand where they've got bottlenose dolphins and false killer whales that are sort of going with one another and communicating, it seems, with one another, which is super, super neat. But I, I love that Lucas yep. story. Our Los Angeles class, just for you guys, if you ever get the chance to go whale watching any of your students, uh, gray whales and fin whales I know are off the coast of California. Uh, really spectacular animals, especially fin whales. They're so big, they're so amazing. Uh, what a neat creature. All right, we've got time for three more questions. Time flies when you're having fun, Bill. Uh, so let's go back to Alameen. You guys got your camera all on, so unmute that mic. Uh, and welcome in, guys. Hey, grade twos. <laughs> you were all in front of the camera two seconds ago. Come on back up, unmute the mic. <laughs> we can't hear you yet. You got to unmute. Mute. There we go. You're good. Yes. Go, ahead. go ahead, Daniel. Unmute. Yes, it's done. It's unmuted. You can. Can narwhals break ice? Yes, they can. Um, they wouldn't necessarily be using their big tusk for it, though. They'd be using the top of their head. Um, not very thick ice. Maybe up to maybe thirty centimeters or a foot thick. Nothing thicker than that, um, but uh, but yes, they can break through some ice. They'd have to be careful though, because they wouldn't want to get their tusks stuck in it. I'm trying to find this other question. We've gotten so many questions in the chat. Um, I know that Kevin in Ms. Dean Camp's class wanted to know which whale can call the furthest. Like, is there one that we can record from the furthest distance away? Blue whales have been recorded from the United Kingdom all the way to 
somewhere on the east coast of the U.S. I think it was Massachusetts. No way. Cross an entire ocean basin, a thousand kilometers. Okay. How, like, so explain this to me because I know sound transmits better in water. So that's a, a thing that I, a lot of acoustics researchers talk about. It's just a denser medium for that. But that is such an incredible distance. I mean, how they could tell the same way because they had recorders on both those coasts and were like, okay, same signature, same everything. Yep, and they would have done the speed calculations as well because we have the nice thing about acoustics is it's based in physics, so we get some very precise calculations. But there's something called the so far channel, which is a, a weird term. So far channel, it's about a thousand meters deep in the ocean, and it is the most efficient sound propagating duct anywhere. And effectively, a signal will come down; it'll get stuck in the SOFAR channel, and it'll just start bouncing back and forth and keep going all the way across the ocean. And so because blue whales are so loud and the SOFAR channel is kind of the perfect environment for low frequency blue whale calls, they were able to do it from one side of the ocean to the other. That is, I mean, it's truly, sorry, I mean, like I might, my grin hurts actually a little bit. It's so cool. I mean, that is the neatest thing. You can call across an ocean. I mean, we have telephones and we have video calls and we're able to do this sort of thing. But to think that animals could rely on something like that and and to learn to utilize that. And so, anyway, just unbelievable. Very cool. Thank you for that question, Kevin. Um, let's head to Miss uh, Camarena, and then we'll wrap up with a great question from our YouTube groups. <laughs> oh, there you go. Hey, hi. Yes, I have a student named Ashley in our fifth grade class that has a question. Go ahead and unmute, Ashley. Is there any whales that might become extinct? I think the question was, are there whales that might become extinct? Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. All right, so I'm going to focus on some of our Arctic species first. So um, all, all species of whale have been assessed by scientists for kind of how big their populations are and what threats they're facing. And so there are a number of species that are, are considered at risk of extinction. So, for example, the bowhead whales that I, um, that I study, they're considered special concern, which is a kind of technical way of saying they're okay right now, but they've got a lot of big threats. The beluga whales are considered that I study are considered not threatened because they're one of the biggest populations and they're quite healthy. But beluga whales in other locations are are, are definitely considered uh, endangered. So, for example, in Cook Cook Inlet in Alaska, or in the um, Saint Lawrence River here in Canada, both of those populations are considered endangered because there's only, I think, the Saint Lawrence has about 400 or so beluga remaining, and they were having a lot of trouble having healthy calves. They're, the mothers would have calves and then the calves would would die um and so they they just weren't able to have healthy babies and and the adults were dying off a bit as well um so that's one population of um of the species that i was talking about today for example that's that's considered very endangered um one of the there's another species of bowhead whale that lives um over in um on the east side of greenland in, in an area called Svar svalbard um, so between Greenland and Svalbard, um, and look that up on a map because it's a really cool spot. Um, but that's the, the Spitsbergen population of bowhead whale. And last I heard, the population estimate was around 100 whales left. Um, and that's because of commercial whaling. They, they were hunted nearly to extinction, and they've rebounded a little bit. And it ends up that they're living in a really hard area for us to survey, so we don't have very good estimates of them. They spend a lot of time in the thick ice, and they don't really come out into the open water, like the, unlike the other species, um, populations of bowhead whale. Um, the most endangered whale in the world is the vaquita, which is a small porpoise that lives... Um, in the Gulf of Mexico, I believe. And and there's just a handful of individuals left in that area. Uh, thanks for spelling it out, Jesse. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things about whales, and I think this leads really nicely into our last question, is that you mentioned this commercial whale fishery. We've talked about this in a few of our, our broadcasts. You mentioned the harpoon story with our, our bowhead whale. And one of the great transitions ever, in fact, it helped inspired by soundscapes of hearing whales for the first time and how amazing that was and their ability to communicate led to this near total ban on whale hunting around the world. There are still some whales hunted by some countries and in a, in a much smaller volume than they used to be, but this allowed whale populations that chance to recover from human influence to some degree. There's a lot of threats still facing them. We've talked about those today, uh, but I think it's a really successful story of what we can do if we just leave nature to its devices and, and don't over harvest it. Uh, and so a great question from Mr. Hill's class is, how can we help save the environment? What is one thing that every student can do? If they're on a coast or not, uh, what can people do here today to help protect whales or the environment in general? 
probably the biggest thing that you can all do is just to continue to be curious and to learn, honestly. Um, whales are big and they live in big environments and doing simple things like, um, like there, there really aren't any simple things that, that, uh, that students can do that will directly save whales. Uh, but being more conscious about the animals that live around you and growing up to have that appreciation for animals means that um, kind of when you're when you're older, you will have this appreciation for everything that's around you and you'll be able to make a big difference as an adult. Um, a, a big way for saving whales right now is honestly how we vote and the pressure that we put on the government for for saving them. And um, and that's the only reason that the government, for example, considers whales to be a priority is is a big part of that is because of public pressure and and public the public loves whales. So so learning that way. Other other things that you can do um, is being more sustainable with your with your life, using less disposable products. Um, getting out and and um, relying less on fossil fuels so instead of going for a car ride with your family go for a bike ride things like that yeah. that maybe have a big difference for the environment as a whole keeping a healthy environment maybe helping to slow down climate change which could have a big influence on on the arctic whales although we think that the trajectory for sea ice loss might might already be set but every little bit is going to help anyways for for how warm the ocean gets and so, so little things like that you can certainly do. Yep. I really think, you know, one of the distilled messages of all the broadcast during Oceans Week and in general with Exploring by the Sea Your is care. Care about the decisions you make. Care about who you vote for if you have that opportunity. Care about what you buy. Uh, and care about wildlife and care about wild places. Uh, a lot of this has been inspired through our programs this year, and, and stories like this really help go a long way to making that possible. We also ran our Backyard Bio Initiative here at Exploring Mother Seed Your Pants, getting kids out, exploring the natural world near them. And as you saw with Dr. Halliday and with a lot of our speakers, that inspiration starts really young at the age of a lot of our students today. So be inspired, be excited, and it makes a world of difference. So I'm really glad we had the chance to, to end with that for today's broadcast. And I want to stress again, for kids keen on learning more, a few quick things. Blue Planet 2, my favorite natural history documentary ever. You can see so many of these amazing animals in the wild. Uh, it's just such a special program. If you want to learn more about the Wildlife Conservation Society, wcscanada.org is your one-stop shop for that. The So Far Channel is the coolest thing that I didn't expect to be sharing, but is like the neatest thing ever. Whales can yell across oceans, and that just blows my mind. Um, in, for sounds in general, my obsession of the week, soundofyourpark.com, protected areas around the globe, marine, terrestrial, all over this planet. If you want to hear more amazing soundscapes like Bill shared today, please do check that out. And of course, Ocean Week Canada. This program is the last of our eight-part series uh, in partnership with so many oceans groups across Canada. Such a special program. If you care about Canada's oceans, if you care about the world's oceans, check out their resources, check out their programs. It's been an amazing weekend, and thank you so much to all our groups for joining us. Bill, uh, I, as you know, uh, we end every broadcast by bringing in our classes to say a quick thank you and goodbye. So Miss Camarena's class in Alameen Elementary, I'll bring you back into the broadcast. Thank you so, so much.